There is a uh, prayer that I utter each time that I speak and I commend to you. Lord, give me the strength to tell and pursue the truth, especially when it's inconvenient to me. <clears throat> George Bernard Shaw asked a rhetorical question, must a Christ die in torment in every age to save those that lack imagination? Einstein said imagination is more important than knowledge. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to go someplace you haven't been, then you got to do something you haven't done. Dr. King said that the, that, that the strongest uh, point is to be self-critical, the ability to be self-critical. And we as a conservative movement must examine ourselves what we have done and what we shouldn't do. If the conservatives right now were fighting the Second World War and the invasion of Normandy, you would have an Air Force and a Navy, but no Marines and no soldiers. Because most of your assaults against what the left is doing is an aerial assault. There's no ground strategy. The left has a very effective ground strategy that I would like to outline, and then I want to talk about what should our strategy be to counteract it. I am an activist. I'm an empiricist, so academics call me. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about concrete steps. I'm talking, talking about uh, uh, political and social alliances that we need to form in order to take action to move. We're not going to push back against what the left is doing by having conferences, issuing white papers, and condemning what they're doing. We have to demonstrate to the American people that the values of our founders, the one that we stand for, can produce improved individuals, redeem communities, and transform lives. We have to demonstrate that to people. As a, as a civil rights veteran, uh, I became disenchanted in the 60s when I led demonstrations because a lot of the people who sacrificed most didn't benefit from the change. We led a demonstration outside of a pharmaceutical company and on our picket lines were janitors, hairdressers, ordinary folks. And when they desegregated, they hired nine black PhD chemists. And when we approached them, they said, we got these jobs because we were qualified. I also left the movement on the issue of force busing for integration. I think the opposite of, of, of integration, uh, uh, segregation is not integration, it is desegregation with plurality. I want the ability to go wherever I choose without restrictions. I don't want to be told to. And so for that, I was sort of pushed out of the civil rights movement. I began to work on behalf of low income people of all races to promote their self interest. But let me tell you that the black America is often the moral barometer of the country, and the left uses the birth defect of slavery and Jim Crow as a battering ram to undermine the founding principles of this country. And one of the biggest lies that I'd like to challenge is that somehow the disorganization, the crime, the out of wedlock births, all of the disarray that you see going on in these urban centers over the last 50 years that have been run by liberal Democrats, that somehow that's a legacy of slavery and Jim Crow. This is a lie. Because if you look at the numbers, if poverty and racial discrimination were the principal causes of the challenge that we have today, certainly during the 10 years of the Depression between 1930 and 1940, when racism was enshrined in law, when the unemployment rate among whites was 25% and 40% in the black community, certainly we should have gone to hell in a handbasket under those circumstances. But the reality was that the marriage rate of black Americans during the Depression was higher than any other group in the nation. Our religious institutions exercise, uh, exerted a control over us so that elderly people could walk safely in their neighborhoods without fearing uh, assault by their grandchildren. The incarceration rate up from, from that time up until 1956, blacks were incarcerated only about 12% above their presence in the, in, in the population. And, and so up until 1965, 85% of all black households had a man and a woman raising children. And that is because of the controls we exercise. 
So racism, slavery, never destroy, those were external. But the, but the left's ground game started in the 60s. Because prior to the 1960s, pathology was never associated with poverty. People who were sharecroppers didn't rob folks or rob banks to do things like that. Poverty was never associated with aberrant behavior. What happened was in the 1960s and the outer wedlock births occurred starting in the 60s with the poverty programs in a welfare state. The welfare state became an invading army into the black community. When you look at Cloud and Piven, those social scientists at Columbia University School of Social Work got together and they wanted, they were socialists, they said one of the ways that we can emphasize the, the contradiction of capitalism is this flood the system with welfare uh, 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 applicants and we will bankrupt it. Because in the black community up until 1960s, there was a stigma associated with being on relief. So they had to remove the stigma. So they said, one of the things we can do is first of all, let's re-term re, re, uh, uh, the, the nuclear family as being Eurocentric and therefore racist. The women's movement aided in that because it made the man redundant. The black power movement also chimed in and they added. So you had the cultural setup for this change. But it's not enough to put a policy in place. You have to have a ground game a, 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 a structure to actually carry out. So the poverty programs came along and they opened up uh, poverty offices all over New York, all over Chicago, and they were actively recruiting people onto the welfare. So Cloud and Piven read their work. They said, if we can separate work from income, it will make a man redundant. High school or dropouts will occur, drug addiction, family disintegration, and then, so what happened was they removed the stigma, it moved from social insurance and down to reparations. Uh, when the welfare department used to demand that a woman declare paternity, that was, uh, they, they saw lawsuits said it's a violation of the privacy rights of a woman, so that was eliminated. And so what you saw then exactly was that three to four million people in New York City and others flooded into the welfare system because welfare became more generous than working. At a time when the unemployment rate for black men was 4%, we had this huge influx and what Cloud and Piven predicted began to occur. Outer wedlock base, uh, births began to soar in that community and with the attendant uh, crime, and, and, and what have you. So you saw the disintegration. That's warfare. You have more blacks today killing other blacks than were killed in one year than was killed in the 70 years of the Klan raids that were lynched. These are hard facts for people uh, to accept. And so this is the, it, it's, this is the situation. So, so, so the left had a ground game and it's working. They demonized the country. The very people that created this problem are, are the ones who received the $22 trillion that we spent fixing the problem. So they started a fire and they got money to put the fire out. So 70 cents of every dollar for the last 50 years that of the 22 trillion spent on poverty went not to the poor, but those who serve poor people. They asked not which problems are solvable, but which ones are fundable. <laughs> so what we must do, ladies and gentlemen, is to recognize that conservatives have strategic interests that are compatible with that of the poor. Because you don't benefit from having a, a, a group of poverty. But if your jobs and your income dependent upon working in a poverty industry, then your well-being is at odds with the poor. And so since we have strategic interests, let me lay out a, a four-part strategy that I think we as conservatives can be. First of all, uh, in order to win the Second World War, we had to rely upon insurgents inside of, of France and Italy. We had to supply them with money, with communications, with help because we could not have won the war if we didn't have allies. Low-income leaders that the Woodson Center supports around this country, some 3,000 grassroots leaders, 
They need allies. They are the insurgents today. They are the ones that could, could need the help. And what do these insurgents do? First of all, if we say, as a lot of our conservative scholars do, that 70% of people in these high crime neighborhoods are raising children that are dropping out of school and on drugs and on jail, which means that 30% are not. What the Woodson Center does is go in and look at the capacity of the people to help themselves. In other words, scholars both left and, and right never go into low-income neighborhoods and ask about their capacity because we are oriented towards dysfunction. So what the Woodson Center does is go in, document the fact that people are in poverty but not of poverty. We call them the Josephs. And, and they, are, they are raising children, they're not dropping out of school, but nobody, they, you do not see in the literature an accounting of the resilience of people. People are motivated to change and improve when you show them victories that are possible. But we as conservatives are always reminding people about disasters to be avoided. But why don't we turn our energies in to establishing strategic partnerships with the people inside. One of my biggest heroes, to whom that, it was Julius Rosenwald. Julius Rosenwald is the CEO of Sears, who partnered with Booker T. Washington, and together they went into the South, and they, he put up half the money, the black community matched it, and, they, with, uh, and, and built 5,300 schools that taught about three-fourths of all low-income black children in the South to read and to write. And as a consequence, between 1920 and 1940, the educational gap between whites and blacks was uh, eight, eighth grade for whites, fifth grade for blacks. Because of the Rosenwald Booker T relationship and the building of these schools, that gap closed within six months. If people in the circumstances at those times could close the education gap under segregation, why can't we do it today? We can do it. Let me end by saying what we need to do is apply the principles that operate in our market economy should operate in our social economy. The people I described to you who are, who are in those in poverty but not of poverty, others were uh, in poverty but through God's grace have become redeemed and they're witnesses to others that redemption is possible. And so what we need to do is to provide, they are the social entrepreneurs. In our market economy, only 3% of the people who are entrepreneurs that they generate 70% of the, the, the jobs. Entrepreneurs tend to be C students, not A students. A students come back to universities and teach, C students endow. <laughs> And so our grassroots leaders are social entrepreneurs, but what they need is a relationship with venture capitalists. As, a, as one of my favorite uh, first black uh, millionaires, J.D. Gaston from Alabama, he was 106 when he died. He had a sixth grade education. He said, it's better to say I is rich than I am poor. <laughs>